All right. We've got a new build uh, here at Accurate Rifles and Restorations. This is going to be what I will refer to as an ultimate bench rest rig. Okay. So, heart of the uh, heart of the entire system is going to be a defiance, defiance, deviant tactical, deviant tactical. We'll just go over a broad stroke of the build, and then I'll go over each component kind of in detail if if necessary. So we've got the Defiance Deviant Tactical, a Bartlian M24 Contour, 6.5 millimeter, eight twist barrel, uh, stainless steel, 5R rifling, excellent barrels, excellent, excellent barrels. Probably one of the best for, for this application. It is not light. <laughs> Nothing in this build is lightweight. You know, I do a lot more majority hunting rifles, um, super accurate precision hunting rifles. But uh, I don't know, there's something about just a heavy bench rest rifle rig that just just gets me going. You know, I just that's kind of my preferred uh, shooting discipline is bench rest and uh, look PRS more in the back in the day when I was a younger lad. It's an awesome game. I still support it. I still try to make it to matches either as a <clears throat> spectator or as a, you know, a lot of times I'll just volunteer to spot shots or range, just handle the range activities uh, and stuff like that. And I, I'm an RSO, so, so that comes in handy. You know, I just, I just love it because, you know, F-class, um, bench rest, disciplines, varmint uh, competitions, you know, these guys squeeze every last ounce of, uh, precision out of their out of their rigs so uh kind of near and dear to my heart i, I did i definitely kind of prefer that moving right along my customer says this is a mcmillan as you can see it's not brand new it's actually being repurposed to uh suit this rig it's already been bedded for a remington 700 and uh single shot configuration uh but uh this as well it's probably pff, gosh 12 pounds or something it's it's heavy and it's got the uh, bag riding kind of system on it uh this should be all smooth so we may have a little talk about that i'll uh i can i can remove that and make it smooth again if he wants but uh not sure exactly if he does or not but anyway to mcmillan it'll accommodate the large m24 barrel remington remington 700 footprint with a adl style so no no magazine here, no no floor plate, single shot configuration. As I said, he's a bench rest guy, so he doesn't need he wants it to be single shot. Uh trigger guard there. Trigger, we got a rifle basics. Kind of another 700 style trigger. Bare bones. It does have the bolt release on the bottom. That's going to be unnecessary because the Defiance has the side bolt release now which I may have to alter the stock while I'm at it to get that in there. But we're going to go with this Rifle Basics. Um, real good quality triggers. Nothing bad to say about those guys. Top, top safety. And uh, the sear is not in there right now, but uh, will be later on. Night Force Optic. This is competition. It's an older one. It's made in Japan. So it's definitely a more vintage uh, Night Force scope. Let's see, the magnification goes up to 55, so that's pretty impressive. Certainly not going to miss anything out long range distance. It's got your typical uh, focus here, parallax here, and I believe it's an MOA configuration. Let me just check here. Oh, yeah, look at the turrets there. So it's an MOA. MOA turrets, hopefully an MOA reticle. And uh, let's see here. Yeah, you don't see this too often anymore either. The threaded 
scope cap covers. <laughs> and it is, I'm just checking the reticle here. Let me just zoom out. Oh, huh. very simple reticle. I expected a lot more going on in there. So you just got basically a center dot and then a couple hash marks below it and a dot below that. So yeah, this is an old school scope uh, for sure, but the glass looks really nice. I can see for miles and miles. You can see the top of the mountain and all that stuff. So anyway, very uh, capable scope. So as I said, this is kind of a rig. This is gonna be repurposed into uh, a new, new rifle. Nothing wrong with that. This is a brand new Defiance action, brand new barrel, and then these components here are going to be repurposed. So, uh, a little bit more about the action. This one's pretty exciting and uh, kind of monumental for, for us here at Accurate Rifles and Restorations because it is the very first company bought and shipped to us as an FFL transfer Defiance. We bought this uh, from uh, Altus, Altus Shooting uh, Solutions in Baker's, where are they from? Baker, Florida. It's uh, kind of another uh, milestone achieved and I'm uh, very proud to uh, have been able to do that. So Defiance, they always give you a little logo sticker. And then Altus has their own little silly sticker there, like a skull with night vision on it. And he's, uh, oh, it's got some, some calm, some calm stuff on there too. Your, uh, microphone and your headset. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know what they're trying to convey there, but, uh, that's the customer sticker. And then I'm not sure if it's because they're from Florida or what's going on here, but in the, in the defiance box, we got a little thing, a Tabasco sauce and a hi chew. Hi chew. Uh, Looks like a lemon. No, pina colada flavored, I assume, is a candy chew. I don't know if this is specific to Florida. I've never seen anything like this. Never heard of high chew. Of course, I'm not much of a candy guy. I don't really, like, enjoy candy very often. Highchew.com. So, I don't know. I guess that's just a Altus thing. I've never seen these. I've done... Oh, very, very, very many defiance actions, and I've never seen this included in the box. So I gotta, I gotta assume that's probably Altus's uh, shenanigans going on there. I love Tabasco sauce. I'm not a big fan of pina colada candy, but again, this is the customers he bought it. So we'll just put that right back in the box. I just thought that was kind of, I don't know, a little funny. Funny, haha. -ha. So, uh, Defiance, um, I've covered a lot of these before, maybe not the Deviants, but uh, a lot of anti-X, as you've seen on the channel. And, of course, those are for hunting. This is the uh, complete other end of the spectrum. This is going to be a bench rest heavyweight. I think my latest format has kind of been going to start in the front and work my way back. So, on a Defiance, at least on the Deviant Tacticals, all one piece of steel. You know, not the bolt, obviously, but... Uh, Receiver is all one piece of steel, very heavyweight stainless steel. Up front, you got your deviant integral recoil lug. Let's just give verification on that. I believe they're quarter inch thickness. Yeah, just a little less than 230. Yeah, so 0 0.230 thickness on the recoil lug, integral recoil lug. Very nicely machined. I mean, little details like that are pretty cool. And it makes it look separate, but it's not. Typical action screws, front and back. Uh, ejection port for a, this is obviously a long action. And I did not mention that earlier. This will be fit and chambered for a 6.5 284 Norma. Right, so let me grab a couple. Couple of those rounds. So that's your cartridge. 
65284 Norma. Mm, let's see what it says here. Peterson Brass, that's pretty cool. Kind of hard to read that head stamp, but anyway. If this were a BDL, you know, there's plenty of room to load it. Get closer here. You know, you got tons of room to set bullets out further. You know, and this, these will accommodate 300 wood mags and bigger, bigger cartridges as well. And then, obviously, plenty of room to kick that even a live cartridge out if you wanted. So 65284 Norma, full-length Picatinny rail. Um, again, all one piece. This is nothing, nothing is separate here. This is all the same piece of steel here. And then your typical 700-style trigger footprint there with the uh, pins. They supply you with their own pins for the trigger. And one thing I really like about Defiance and some other actions is they actually have a bottom piece here. So if you're, I don't know what kind of person would put a rem, uh, stock trigger in here, uh, but even the uh, Rifle Basics has a separate uh, sear and sear spring. So the nice thing with that <clears throat> is as you're installing your trigger, the sear and spring don't pop up underneath here. Work around with a Remington, you just put the bolt in there, and that keeps everything encapsulated. But that's just, I don't know, that's kind of nice for us gunsmiths. So yeah, your trigger will sit in there with two cross pins. Let's see what else we got here. Side bolt release, side bolt stop. Kind of the typical thing you'd see there. Looks like it is bearing on the wall of the receiver rather than that pin. So the, the bolt release has a little fore and aft play, which means as that bolt is cycled back, all that force is being transmitted to the back of the receiver rather than the pin. So that's, that's pretty common with modern side bolt release actions these days and long range incorporated. Like when, you, when I install one of their side bolt releases, that's their kind of design is all the force is impacted right back here rather than shearing off your cross pin after time. So very good stop, very smooth action. And then obviously when you want to release it, it releases very easily. So I think that's about all there is to say about this receiver portion. So onto the bolt, spiral fluting, very evident there. Full diameter, 360 degrees spiral fluting. You've got your extractor, M16 style extractor, held in by this cross pin, and then your typical spring-loaded face-mounted ejector. So as that comes back, Cartridges is, cartridge is held by the extractor, pulls out, and then as it encounters the ejection port, it uh, spits it right out from that spring-loaded ejector. A very nice bolt handle. This, again, this bolt, the entire bolt has been machined out of one piece of steel with the exception of the shroud and the in, uh, firing pin assembly. But uh, yeah, that's all, that's all good. Not very nice looking. As far as I know, he's not going to have this Cerakoted or anything. He's just going to leave it like it is. It's not a hunting rig, so we're not caring about shiny stuff. In fact, shiny's usually good with uh, the bench rest guys. Makes it look fancier. That's another reason I like it. You know? It's uh, very high-end, very quality. So we'll just get this firing pin assembly out. You know, so same thing, typical Remington 700 style. <sighs> You've got your firing pin itself. Very nice finish on that, even though no one ever sees that. Firing pin spring. And then the shroud itself with its uh, threads here. Your cocking piece right there. And uh, there is a pin that holds the cocking piece in. You've got to push this down to see it. So this is just my firing pin assembly, disassembly tool. So this end, so it's two ends, this style is for your Remington style. And then back here is for like a Ruger uh, M77. 
So let's see here. Just kind of get the thread started in the body of this tool. This was all made on manual machines a long time ago when I was in school. So once you uh, thread in the shroud, <clears throat> you will take the other end and screw that forward, and then that will reveal your cross pin right there uh, for the cocking piece here. <clears throat> so we've come this far. Why not just keep going? Usually these are really easy to get out. So there's your pen and the shroud itself, or the uh, cocking piece, as it were. There is your cocking piece, disassembled. And that's where it goes on to the firing pen itself. So that may be interesting. Some of you may have never seen that before. All right, there's your shroud. And then the spring and the firing pin. Okay. So super smooth. It's even polished. And then your spring goes over there and there's no snaking or coiling up uh, whatsoever. And then it, it's so nice and smooth. Nothing binding up on that. Same thing with the cocking piece, fully polished, deburred, very, very, very nice. Cocking shroud, same thing, some grease on there, your through pin, and that's that. The uh, extractor, I, owe, I just leave those in because it, it helps me pull out the headspace gauges when I'm chambering and things like that. Uh, but I will remove the old. Uh, uh, ejector. But that'll be okay. So there's your pin for your ejector. And then the ejector itself followed by its spring. God, defiant springs are always so tight. This tripped me up last video with the defiance anti. Crazy. Anyway, trust me, there's a spring under there. I'll get that out later. But there's your ejector. It just goes in its hole. And that little cut in the middle is just for the cross pin. Where the cross pin goes and keeps it, keeps it encapsulated inside the bolt itself. Okay. Um, I think that's all there is to say about the bolt. There is this curious blind hole drilled there. I don't remember seeing that before. Just completely obvious as to what it's for. No, it is not. Huh, I wonder why they put that hole there. Oh, there goes the spring. Yeah, isn't that funny? Just comes out, just falls out. All right, well, so there is a, I don't know if that's a new thing with Defiance or what the heck that's for. But there's a hole in there. Honestly, I don't know. It's prob. I would assume, I guess it's probably for a fixture they have. Probably for a pin. I'm guessing. Not really sure why. Um, and then we've got a stamped 56 there. I'm so curious. I know Defiance has recently been bought and sold, sold and bought. So maybe the new owners are doing that. I've not seen that before. Um, this hole here is for gas relief. If you blow a case, the gases will, they have to shoot back. So that'll just make it shoot out the side. And then usually, well, not on this one. Usually you'll see a gas port on the receiver itself. Okay, there's your gas port in the action, and then when it's cam shut, it's going to be on this side. So they did not allow for that. So that means if you blow a case, 
Gases are going to be forced back. Exit the bolt head. Travel here to the side of the action, and then straight back into your face. <laughs> and there is a pretty considerable gap there, so don't blow a case, guys. I mean, it's easy. You really got to try to blow blow these up, so don't do that. Um, we're talking some significant steel here, so you know I've seen I've seen actions come apart. That's everything. I don't need to take out the side bolt release. Um, typically, when I do that, I always forget it's gone, and then I'll turn this over, and the dang bolt will fly, fly, um, fly out on me. And I don't like doing that. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you can see inside there, but real, just so nice. Very impressive machining. You know, we're talking two thousand dollar action here, so certainly better be. So there you go. Um, that's everything, as far as I can tell. Um, pretty evident here. The stock's got the uh, adjustable cheek riser, or your comb, as a lot of people refer to it as. So, and that does tell. That probably is a McMillan. They usually roll with those one-piece uh, thumb screws to lock them in. And then, obviously, a length of pull can be adjusted by using these spacers. The uh, bedding is going to have to be mostly cut out. Uh, it's the same exact barrel, so that portion will probably be fine. Uh, but the recoil lug, that's wider in the Defiance, so that'll be cut out. And then just most of this, just to give me a fresh surface to bet on again. And he wants to keep the single shot configuration, so that's easily done. And that's about it for that. All right, so as always, I'm gonna measure the measure the action and the bolt, get some dimensions for our barrel, calculate up all that stuff, get the headspace numbers. Okay, as we always do, I got my chambering form, all the specifications and dimensions, uh, kind of a build sheet, as it as it were. Um, so a lot of these are known. Obviously, the date, uh, Defiance, Deviant Tactical, long action, standard bolt face, uh, cartridge is 6.5, 284 Norma. The caliber is 0.264 inches or 6.5 millimeters. Twist rate is 8, 1 and 8 twist. Uh, it's a recessed breech type. Uh, headspace gauges are 284 Winchester. Uh, uh, this all this stuff here, um, as you may or may not know, this is all for blueprinting uh, factory actions like Remingtons and Winchester 70s and Rugers and Howes and Weatherby's and stuff like that. So in this case, you know, we've got a $2,000 action. I damn well better not have to do any truing cuts to this. Um, I do check certain things, but again, these... These are precision made, so it's kind of a mute point to even really bother. But again, I don't assume anything here. So, but anyway, square receiver face, no lap lugs, no. I'll check the lug contact, but generally they're good, and won't know until I get a trigger in there and stuff. But uh, true threads, no way. Action blueprint, no blue, none of that. No bolt sleeves, nothing there. Uh, recoil lug dimensions, they don't really account because they're, it's, a, it's not separate, it's not a separate piece. Uh, plus, you've got this uh, kind of, your shoulder, your torque shoulder is, is higher or uh, protruding from the recoil lug itself. So, in this case, we don't care. Uh, threaded, thread identification is unified. <clears throat> the TPI almost always 16, um, but I do have these little stubs that I use to check things with. And this is comes in handy when blueprinting re uh, Remingtons or anything else too, because then I can accurately find my new major diameter. Um, this one's a standard, a one and one sixteenths by 16. So, <laughs> so if it threads in there, we know it's that's what that is. And it does. 
a little snug. That's fine. Okay, so that's good. We know that it is 16 threads per inch with a pitch of 0 0.0625. The thread angle, 60 degree V thread, which again is a unified uh, universal thread, inch thread. Uh, measurement over wire, don't need that because we know what it is. So we will thread to fit. Major diameter is 1.062 or less, minus. And the minor diameter for this is 985, but it really doesn't matter. We're not, we don't care about a minor diameter because we don't have to calculate anything. And these um, defiances have a relief, nice, generous relief right here in the uh, beginning of the receiver thread, which means the thread tenon, when there's threads on the, on the barrel, there's no need to put a relief cut or a groove back here at the, at the end of the thread on the barrel. So that's really nice. You can just thread up to a stopping point and just makes everything look nicer and gives you um, the ability to walk that uh, breech back if you need to later on down the road when you've burned up the throat and everything. So we've got our chambering reamer. This is a Manson made out east, northeast Michigan. A very fine reamers with a live pilot. And like anything, I've got the pilot set. So they're incrementally sized, so that way I can find the bore size perfectly. And then also by Manson are the go and no-go gauges for a 284 Winchester. Six and a half millimeter bullet, <clears throat> so the bore diameter, 0.264, and the groove is 0.256. And then we gotta do some measuring here. So I'll measure what I refer to as A, B, and C. So B is torque shoulder to the bolt face where the cartridge sits. And then C is torque shoulder to the nose of the bolt, which will help us calculate the depth of the recess in the breech. So the first closest measurement is going to be C. Let's come down and check that. <clears throat> and we are at 8, just a second, 8, 19. Let me just check here. Um, 8, 17. Eight, I go around the bolt, or I go around, just verify it's the same all the way around. Eight, 17, and eight, 17. So C is eight, 17 point eight one seven thousandths of an inch, that is. B, so nine sixty six. Yeah, that's about right, nine sixty six. 0.966. So those two measurements are good. And then I want to get the bolt, which will help us figure out the thread tenon. So it's going to be the nose of the bolt to the bolt lug, the front of the lug itself. So, so all this is just ensuring that I'm machining everything to spec and safely, and also to cover my behind in the event of any kind of a, the extremely rare occasion that something might go wrong, uh, as far as like a catastrophic failure or anything like that. I can always go back, find my records, <clears throat> and if there's anything left to check, they can check against my notes and see that everything was machined properly to specification and dimensions. I got 150 on that side and 150 on that side in terms of the bolt nose to the bolt lug, the front of the bolt lug. 150, that sounds about right. So I'll get my calculator out here. 100.150 oh, plus, what did I get for C? 817 equals 967 
So that's going to be A. Point nine. Can't write the point nine sixty seven, and that correlates very closely with the headspace dimension nine sixty six. Now, um, as with the, a lot of people refer to it as the crush factor, which means as the barrel's torqued on, it actually it'll screw on a little bit further than you would be able to by hand. So we've got to account for that in our calculations. Um, something like this, a high quality boutique action with a fixed or a one piece recoil lug. We're going to subtract eight thousandths from this. 0 0.008. So that leaves 959. 959 is going to be our thread extension lake length. Uh, by the way, do not use these numbers. If you have your own defiance action and barrel, don't don't go by what I'm going here. You, me you always measure, always measure. Even if they provide a ten in print for you, it's kind of a case by case basis. But if you're running switch barrels, go by the print. If you're if this is a custom rifle, one barrel situation that's torqued onto a shoulder, you measure. So anyway, 959 is our thread extension. Our bolt nose recess um, typically is gonna be 705 on these standard style uh, actions. So the bolt nose itself measures 696. So 705 should be plenty. I'm just checking because that extractor is going to pivot this way. But uh, I've never had a defiance that needed more room than that. So 0 0.705 for the diameter. Our depth is going to be what we measured at C. Generally, it's going to be 155 to 160, somewhere in there. So we're going to take 967 from the 817, which is 150, and then you add, you can add 10. This is a bench rest gun. We are in a bit of a dusty environment here, but, uh, you know, five to 10,000 should be plenty on that. So we'll just call it 155. Oops, right here. The depth, 155 of the bolt nose recess itself. Moving on down, measurement from action bolt face was B, 966, minus our thread extension, not what we measured here, but our thread extension, 959, because that's what the physical thread extension is going to be. So, 966 minus 959 equals 007. And then again, here's where we account for that crush, the shoulder crush in the headspace. So seven thousandths minus two thousandths, obviously that's going to be five. So our headspace will be five thousandths. Five thousandths protruding from, from here. Our headspace dimension, 005, will basically be pretend like this is in in the uh, chamber uh, the back of the gauge or the case will protrude five thousandths from this surface approximately i always chamber tight especially on a bench rest gun minimal absolute minimal has base so that number may be a few thousands off uh in fact i'll I'll use the no-go gauge, but typically in this situation, you're going to put a piece of little cellophane tape on the back of the go, so that splits that difference in half. Barrel torque spec, generally around 100, 100 foot-pounds. That also kind of correlates with our uh, match grade headspace, our tight headspace uh, minimum, because you can control that a little bit. So if it's already minimal, Going to 100, it should be still fine, but say you chambered like a thousandth too deep, you can increase that torque if you want. 100 foot-pounds is pretty severe, so I wouldn't suggest going that far. 
But anyway, uh, barrel length, 27 inches. Um, yeah, that's finished, finished already. So I will be cutting a new fresh crown on that, but it should still fall within 27 inches. Now, I don't believe we're threading this barrel. So we're going to be in a bench rest. All those guys love 11 degree for a crown. 11 degree target. Crown. Um, and I always put a 60 degree internal crown. Um, this one already has one. So that I'll duplicate this. So I'm going to cut this behind all this just to give us some fresh rifling. Um, lately, Bartley has been supplying these barrels at finished length. Uh, so say you ordered a 26 inch barrel. So they usually just send you a 26 inch and then you just kind of finish, finish up your length on the breech end, all this stuff. So I will slice this off. I always give these stubs to the customer with their information on it. Um, it's there. They paid for the barrel. It's their stuff. It's got the serial number and all that good stuff on it. So, uh, I always kind of just joke, yeah, I might be able to make a necklace out of it or something like that. But, uh. I'll cut that off and send it back with the rifle, send it home. Whatever they want to do with it's fine. So what I'm getting at is um, I'm going to have to call Bartlane and see because we can cross-reference with the serial number and determine whether or not we got to cut an inch off of the uh, muzzle. I've bore scoped this as well. Um, that's what this used to say, was scoped in the date. Um, so the bore and the rifling look extremely good and acceptable for us. Okay, so uh, mark caliber on barrel, that's just the engraving. Uh, we have to do that, but I put that there because if there's anything special, like uh, initials or, or some, you know, in memory of or whatever the heck they want to uh, engrave on there, that's what I'll put in there. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think he wants anything special like that. And then on my form, the uh, receiver internal diameter, again, this is for blueprint and rebuilding Remingtons and things. Um, that way I know what to cut the sleeves to. So this really doesn't apply in this situation. <clears throat> the barrel bore, that'll be determined later with uh, the live pilots. Uh, so I'll, I'm sure I'll show that in the uh, machining portion of this series. We'll just determine that based off of known pilots. Barrel serial number. I'm not going to put this on video, but uh, it is on the barrel itself. And then scoped, yes, good, smiley face. So we know it's been scoped. The bore will be figured out later. So as always, there's the spec sheet nearly filled out. This guy's name is Ken. So yeah, we've got all of our dimensions now. We are ready to go to the machine and get the barrel centered up. You know, obviously we bore scoped it, so that's, that's the first step. I will part this off, very skinny, very small part off of the uh, information. Recenter it, all that good stuff, and then go to town on the thread tenon. So that wraps up this portion of it. Uh, again, I showed you the reamers and the measuring tools. So, so yeah, that's uh, standard practice for anything I'm doing here. <clears throat> So I think that's about all there is to say on that. Let's, uh, let's end it here, and uh, we'll be back with the uh, next stages of the chambering and fitting of this barrel.